I've had a question that's been simmering since yesterday morning when you do your diagram of the physical luck and response of the organism. I wondered if God has any place on your scheme or if we just have to bring her in ourselves. Um, I guess my own thinking is toward process theology and uh, if you're asking me for a real fast one, I don't have the time to go into it here. I've done some presentations on spirituality and differentiation and I guess I believe that it would be, uh, God would come into it depending on turning up that third dial. Thank you. All right, I'd connect it up somehow that way. Um, the thing about, where I've done presentations about spirituality, is I've tried to emphasize the point that spirituality is not something to be implanted in people. It's not something you give people. That it's something to be freed from people. That it's something in people and something to be freed. If you think in those terms, you'll see there's an extraordinary amount of parallels between all the concepts of differentiation uh, and any concept you would have about spirituality. The second would be, many, many years ago, when I would do readings in cultural anthropology and read Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict and Malinowski and all those people who did the pioneering research in the South Seas, I was struck by uh, particularly Malinowski's book, Magic, Science, and Religion. And I've done some presentations called Magic, Science, and Therapy. And the, the critical issues in magical thinking are the idea that you can will something to happen beyond the natural order of things. That's what magic is about. Magic defies the natural process of things. Uh, if you think a certain way, something will happen. If you stick a pin in a doll, it will cripple somebody, and so on. And that's one idea that I've always thought was important. A second idea that I got out of Malinowski and then I read Freud and Totem and Taboo and Phrase of the Golden Bough, some of his ideas, and all these people were intrigued about the magical rites. Malinowski, for example, noticed that the South Sea Islanders had a whole lot of ritual associated to fishing in the sea, but they didn't have any ritual associated to fishing in the lagoon and that there was clearly a connection between where the rituals developed and anxiety and fear. And then another thing that I think Malinowski, Freud and Fraser and so on pointed out was that magic is ad hoc. It doesn't work on universal principles in the sense that when people think magically they want something to happen right then and there that's specific and the hell with what natural laws it breaks to make it happen. So the first idea was that it goes against natural processes. The second idea was that it um, was ad hoc. It was specific to a particular situation. The third idea that I thought was always interestingly connected was the issue of morality and ethics. Uh, magic is totally devoid of morality and ethics. Uh, magic is more associated with, you could associate it, I think, more with polytheism in which it is intensely selfish. Can you get the right God on your side? For me, the two stories told in the Talmud, in Jewish tradition, about prayer that have stuck with me the longest are the following. And they fit, I think, with the magic stuff and the ethical stuff and so on. And either story could be used to make either point. In the first, Two men come into a town and they see a house burning in the distance. And the one, the first man says, I pray that's not my house. And the other man says, that's an unethical prayer. Why? Because you're in effect praying it's somebody else's house. So that would lead to the notion that no prayer is ethical, the coming true of which would be to the detriment of another of God's creatures. Which says something about crossing yourself at the foul line before you shoot the basket. But... <laughs> but it's an interesting universal principle. 
The second one is two men come into a town and they hear a woman scream in the distance and the first man says, I pray that's not my wife and the second man says, that's a useless prayer. Why? Because she's already screamed. And those two stories have always stuck with me about the limitations of prayer or the direction toward which prayer ought to go. And it always seems to me to have fit in with the larger notion of how you distinguish magic from religion. Well, what I like about Bowen's ideas about differentiation is that it is a focus on responsibility for oneself. And because of that, I think it leads to a highly spiritual notion. And I think it fits in with what I was saying yesterday, that the, um, the beginning of a mature religious philosophy is saying, I will not make my salvation dependent on the functioning of others. Now, it seems correct that I ought to, having, having used the word differentiation, we all use the word so much now, that I try to define it for you. I'm going to read to you from my chapter in the Handbook of Family Therapy, Volume 2, which came out a few years ago, in which I did the piece on Bowen theory. And this, uh, this chapter is included in the reprints. Differentiation is the lifelong process of striving to keep one's being in balance through two reciprocal processes, one external and one internal. The external process could be called self-definition, and the internal process is self-regulation. Differentiation is charting one's own way by means of one's own internal guidance system, rather than perpetually eyeing the scope to see where others are at. It refers to a process rather than a goal. When people say, I differentiated from my wife, my child, my parent, and so on, that proves they do not understand the concept. It refers to a direction in life rather than a state of being, to the capacity to take a stand in an intense emotional system, to saying I when others are demanding we, to containing one's reactivity to the reactivity of others, which includes the ability to avoid being polarized to maintaining a non-anxious presence in the face of anxious others. It refers as well to knowing where one ends and another begins, to being able to cease automatically being one of the system's emotional dominoes, to being clear about one's own personal values and goals, to taking maximum responsibility for one's own emotional being and destiny, rather than blaming others or the context, such as the culture, the gender, or environmental forces. It is an emotional concept, not a cerebral one, but it does require clear-headedness, and it has enormous consequences for new ways of thinking about leadership. But no one ever gets more than 70% of the way to the goal. In other words, one-third of your life, at least, you ain't differentiated. <laughs> Differentiation is not to be equated, however, with similar-sounding ideas such as individuation, autonomy, or independence. First of all, it has less to do with a person's behavior than with his or her emotional being. Second, there is a sense of connectedness to the concept that prevents the mere gaining of distance or leaving, no less cutting off from being the way to achieve it. Third, it has to do with the fabric of one's existence, one's integrity. Now, that seems to me to be a highly spiritual way of thinking about life. And in terms of the question that was asked, which is a theological question, and obviously in a room like this we have all kinds of different theological viewpoints, and I'm just defining my position on this, uh, I guess I would tend more toward process theology than anything else. And I would tend to think in terms of differentiation invoking the holy processes, something like that. Um, I wrote a fable many years ago, which I've never published. 
and it was a high holy day sermon in which I had the Jewish God Elohim get together with the other gods Venus, Mars, Neptune, Kronos and so on. Well you're only supposed to believe in one God so my idea was the way I got out of that was to say the other gods are at other universes and Elohim is still the only God in this universe. <laughs> but the other gods all trained at universe one and then left. <laughs> and whenever Elohim comes along, the other gods are very upset because Elohim is a brooder, B-R-O-O-D-E-R. -O -O -E Elohim does a lot of thinking, whereas the other gods simply create the world in their image. And it was entitled, In the Image of God. That was the title of it. And Venus was saying to Elohim, why do you make so much trouble for yourself? In my universe, everybody loves all day long, all the time. I've created them in my image. And Mars says, and in my, in my world, everybody fights all the time. And I've created everybody in my image, and so on, down through the pantheon. And they say, you know, you're no fun. And Elohim's response is, well, they all meet in a rest home for the gods. That's what's what they <laughs> So now you know where God is if your prayers aren't being answered. <laughs> and um, Elohim's response is, I am a God of differentiation, and you can't clone differentiation no matter how well differentiated the primary copy. Okay? That therefore, if you are, if you believe in co-creation, if you believe in process ongoing, if you believe in growth, then one has to accept the freedom that goes with it, the evil that is a byproduct of that, and a God who believed in differentiation couldn't clone him or herself, itself, whatever you want to say. Now, that is... Again, I'm not a systematic theologian. I tend to, uh, my theology tends to come out of my stories and so on, but that's in good rabbinic tradition also. Uh, and it fits, I presented that idea right now, because it fits with the qu initial question that was asked. It's also a solid basis for talking about leadership in any kind of spiritual way, which is, it would mean that a leader, to the extent the leader is well differentiated, can't expect others to follow in their image or in their footstep by willing it to happen. Because as soon as you willed it to happen, they wouldn't be in your image anymore. They would be clones. I'm trying to get across a very subtle idea, which is... If all you want to do is make other people the way you are now, fine, go do it. But they, they won't be the way you are now if you make them the way you are because they didn't go through the growth process it took for you to get to where you are. Okay? I'm constantly having to say to parents who are upset with their kids for making mistakes, why can't they have your wisdom without going through your experience? That's the subtle, difficult issue. I appreciated very much the comments that were made last night. I've never been through that kind of experience where anyone ever asked people to make the comments. I always get them on the back of sheets of paper from the evaluations instead. Um, and I think among the comments, while I appreciated them all, among the comments I appreciated most was the sense that I got from the audience that you didn't feel I was trying to clone you to think the way I did. And then the question is, I guess, in my presentations, I'm trying to model the very leadership I'm trying to talk about. But it's not like I even try to do it, I just do it. In other words, I'm not conscious of, of an effort to model it that way. And I, uh, I fail most with my own kids, like everybody else, you know. How, how, do, you, how do you possibly... One day I, I said to somebody, you know, my kids have done best in the areas where I'm least anxious and most incompetent. How 
how do you keep yourself from overfunctioning in other people's space? How does a leader... In other words, all the training that we've all gotten as leaders is to motivate others, to form others, to change others, and so on. And what I've been trying to head toward all the way through is the notion of presence, that a certain kind of presence will modify the negative processes and promote the positive processes. That's why I talked so much about immunology last night. Now, to go on from there, unless someone else has a burning question, I'm going to just... This first question, I think, just leads in so well that I want to stay with that. Now, there was something I did not talk about last night, and frankly, it was only when I walked in the door this morning that I realized to my shock that I hadn't put it in, because it is such a critical part of everything I was trying to say last night. But time moved much faster than I expected it to. It has to do with the nature of pathology. So that what I want to... Um, let me think how to do this. I want to put together two things. They are, as I said just a few minutes ago, the inhibiting or nullifying of the negative and the promoting of the positive. I have written in some of the papers that appear in reprints that healing is a natural phenomenon. That when you start thinking that you can heal somebody else, that's willful thinking. You cannot heal another person. The, uh, the surgeon does not sew your cells together. The cells know what to do if the conditions are right. That what physicians or healers do primarily is two things. Oh, I never put this on. Okay. Which is this one for, that one? I've been wired for two days. <laughs> the, um, the two things that healers do, surgeons, physicians, any kind of healer, is inhibit the inhibitors and promote the resources. So that, for example, bringing down inflammation is a way of inhibiting the inhibitors, even though the inflammation can have some positive effects too. But generally speaking, what a physician is going to do is not put your cells together. The physician is going to do those things which thwart, thwart, T-H, thwart, T-H-W-A-R-T, thwart, which thwart, thwart that which prevents healing. And then the physician is also going to do those things which promote healing, such as jump-starting the resources with certain injections. I think that carries over to all healing. I think that carries over to emotional healing. I think it carries over to being a consultant to any organization. When consultants go into systems thinking they're going to heal the system, that's willful stuff. Yes, now and then you can come up with just the right technique, just the right answer to a specific problem, now and then. But primarily, I teach consultants to organizations to do the same thing I teach therapists, pastoral counselors to do. And that is to be a healing presence. And the healing presence is one who brings down the inhibitors by being non-anxious. And the major way you be non-anxious is not giving solutions, not being quick to rescue. And you inhibit the inhibitors. Or you jumpstart the resources sometimes with challenge. Comfort, empathy, all that good stuff will not challenge people into growing. Now, so there's two sides, and you see what I'm doing here is putting leadership and healing together. I'm saying they're really not different. Whenever you are in a position to promote change, you're a leader 
or a healer, whichever phrase you want to use. They're interchangeable from my point of view. You're trying to help some other system reorganize itself. And as I spoke yesterday, for that to really work, you have to commit your own life to that constant process also. That's different from being a technician. And what bothers me most about what has happened to religion, pastoral counseling, but religion generally, is it has uh, worshipped at the Moloch of today, which is data and methodology and technique, and has lost that original awareness of the importance of the spiritual presence. Now, what I want to talk about for a while is the two sides. But first I want to talk about the negative side, which is what, in effect, we are up against. And the way I'm going to talk about this is to talk a little bit about empathy and a little bit about pathology. It is generally not realized today, but the word empathy came into the English language very recently. I can remember in the 1950s in college writing an English theme in which everybody was now using the word empathetic, and I put it in my essay, and the teacher marked it down wrong and said, no, empathic is the right form. Today in a dictionary they'll give you both. The Oxford English Dictionary published in 1931 after a 50-year effort in which people spent a lifetime looking up one word. I assume you all know what the OED is, a 12-volume history of the English language. Gives you every word all the way back to its origins and who first used it. The word empathy does not appear in the Oxford English Dictionary, published in 1931. It came into the English language in the 1920s as a translation of a German word used in aesthetics. So the word empathy came into the English language in relation to aesthetics that by empathizing, primarily I think it was with theater, of how to empathize with characters and the role of empathy in plays and then eventually to other forms of art. And it was a German word that was used and I forgot what it was and someone coined the Greek equivalent in the 1920s and that turned out to be empathy. It wasn't really until after World War II that it came into common parlance. What is the advantage of empathy over compassion? They mean almost identical things. Compassion is Latin and means feeling with. Empathy is Greek and means feeling in. And there was somewhere along the way some kind of notion that if you could get inside of people, that was better than if you felt for them from outside. I disagree with that concept completely. I think being a well self-defined presence to somebody else and staying out of their space is more health-giving than getting into other people without limits. And my perception is that the word empathy is often a disguise for anxiety. I'm all in favor of empathy when it comes out of a self-differentiated position. The problem is when people think that empathy is enough and you don't have to define yourself first. It's just too easy that way. But the empathic orientation leads to enormous projection. It's harder to be objective about what you are feeling for if your first concern in life always is others rather than your own self-differentiation, which includes everything I read earlier. There is another reason that I am concerned about empathy as a starting point in healing and in leadership. And this takes me around to the second major notion about the nature of pathology. And this is what I feel badly that I did not mention last night. Uh, by the way, I, what is the son's name? Yeah, uh, his son who was here and gave us the picture, I don't know if you're all aware, he's a surgeon. And he came up to me last night and he said, you know, 
immunology has been one of my major interests all through my life. So for him, this lecture in honor of his father, on him, where I went into immunology, um, really hit home for him. So I just share that with you. I asked him if I had been medically correct all the way through, and he said yes. <laughs> I wanted to make sure of that. <laughs> um, one day, something hit me, and what I'm about to present to you, I have not read anywhere, and I believe this is a genuine, original concept. If not a concept, at least it's a general, it's a genuinely original putting together of some things. All right? One day it hit me that what all pathogens have in common, what all pathogenic elements have in common, is lack of self-regulation. I have found no exception to that. Let me give you some examples. I'll give you, uh, just to take four examples, a virus, a malignant cell, an alcoholic or any other kind of troublemaking member of a family or a congregation, or a totalitarian nation, that all four of those have in common that they lack self-regulation. I'll explain a little bit more in detail. A virus, a malignant cell, a chronically troublesome member of any system, and a totalitarian nation who could be seen as the chronically troublesome member of the family of nations. Viruses, for example, and this is in a way talking about the nature of creation. Viruses, as you may or may not know, do not fit the old 20 question game of animal, vegetable, or mineral. They're a fourth order of things somehow. Because while on the one hand they reproduce, and that would make it sound like they're animal as compared to mineral anyway, they can't propel themselves. Viruses can only move, they have no animus. Viruses can only move by getting into a stream. They must be propelled by some other force. The way viruses procreate is they infect a host, a bacterium or a cell, say, and they take over the DNA machinery of that cell and turn it into a factory for the reproduction of itself. And then when enough of them have been created, they burst out through the membrane and go and infect and take over other cells. Now, I've always been intrigued by that notion and the symbiosis fable, which I've read, or written, uh, again, I, I wanted to put that in last night because I wanted, again, still to get across this notion of the connection between biology and relationships. A few of you have read this, but I'll read it to you quickly. It's very short. It's a dialogue between a bacterium and a virus. All right? And they've lived together a long time, the virus having infected the bacterium. Not all viruses are bad. I want you out, said the bacterium to its virus. What are you talking about, the virus responded. Out, replied the bacterium, out of my space. All the way beyond my limits, said the bacterium. Why, asked the virus. I no longer want to share my existence with you. Things don't happen that way. I know, said the bacterium. We've lived together a long time, the virus added. Nonetheless, said the bacterium, it's my space and I no longer want to share it with you. You don't know what you're doing, responded the virus. I was never more determined. But after all this time, I want to be myself, answered the bacterium. But you can't be without me. I can't be because of you. You're going against your nature, said the virus, only against my past behavior. What's the difference? That's what I want to find out. You're considering a different virus then, asked the virus? <laughs> Not right now, said the bacterium. 
You would try it on your own at the beginning anyway. I've done my best. I was always benign. It has to do with me, not with you. But what were you before I came along? Much the same as I am now. Before we came together, you weren't near what you are now. That's not what I meant, said the bacterium. I don't understand. Well, I haven't really changed. But you have greatly. No, I still depend on you in order to be me. What's wrong with that? That's transformation, not change. What's the difference? In change, something remains the same. I made you you, said the virus. You helped greatly. Helped, we needed one another. We don't actually know that. How could you doubt it? It's just a new thought. We became one organism, said the virus. That's precisely why I want you out, responded the bacterium. You'll regress for a while, for a while, forever. I am determined. How will you function without me, asked the virus. I no longer need you to turn me on. Scene two. <laughs> it's not fair, said the virus. It's vital. What will I do? Go find another host. Suppose they're all occupied. New ones come along all the time. Suppose they're not compatible. That's not my problem. Boy, said the virus, I really have turned you off. No, I turned me off. Suppose you turn me off. What's the difference? We're that close? Till now, inseparable. There is a difference, said the virus. What's that? Whether or not you've really changed. How could you doubt it? It depends on the turnoff. This time, I control the switch. Maybe it was only a switch. What's your point? Who did you turn off? I won't let you affect me, said the bacterium. You're avoiding my question. I'm trying to define myself, said the bacterium. By turning me off? No, by turning me off to you. I affect you that much, asked the virus, automatically. Then you really haven't changed. You no longer control me, said the bacterium. It's my presence, isn't it? Scene three. I'm set to go, said the virus. Goodbye. Still determined, definitely. I have one more question, asked the virus. What? Why didn't you leave? Well, I'm not in your space. Does that really matter? It's the basic issue. From your perspective, said the virus. What do you mean by that? Well, you adapted as much as I did. But you were the invasive one. You gave me the opening. I couldn't help myself. You didn't allow others in. I was particularly sensitive to you because of my makeup or yours. Well, that doesn't matter now. In one way, it does. How's that? Survival. That's why I must separate, said the bacterium. I was becoming malignant, asked the virus. Yes, because of my makeup or yours. Well, I just got used to you. You are understating compatibility. Please leave. Is there no way we can live together, asked the virus? Only if you stay outside. You'll want me back only if you stay outside. Then what's the use? Something might evolve. Now, I'm sorry I didn't read that last night. I put it down to do it, and as I say, time went fast. That was an effort to capture again what I've been talking about, that the processes on cellular levels and the processes on relational levels are extraordinarily similar, are probably parallel, and for all we know are homologous. That is, are parallel evolutionary bypaths. The virus in all events is invasive. It infects. Sometimes it works to turn on a cell in a positive way, but for the most part, I believe, viruses are simply selfish, reproduce themselves, and go on. Malignant cells have a similar character. Malignant cells differ from normal cells in three or four major respects. The normal cell will differentiate from its parent cell, move into a stage called specialization, where it has a function, a purpose, where it creates a colony of similar, like-minded, if you could use that phrase, cells. During the process of specialization, and being part of a larger colony, 
and having a purpose, normal cells stop proliferating. They stop reproducing. And there's a fourth thing. Under the right conditions, normal cells will commit suicide when it's to the benefit of the, or the larger organism. Cancer cells differ in all four respects. Cancer cells do not differentiate and develop a self. They almost, by that, therefore, do not specialize. They do not, to get, in other words, it's a marvelous parallel. Organisms, if you can use that general word, creatures, it's hard to find a word to put malignant cells and people together, but whatever word you use, that do not have self, do not colonize. They do not specialize. They have no function. They do not maintain one in any consistent way. The third characteristic of malignant cells is that they go right on proliferating and reproducing themselves without limit. Unlike, as I said, normal cells, that when they go through the process of specialization, stop reproducing. And then there's a fourth characteristic that I just mentioned, and I will give you a very fancy term that is probably only a few years old, and it comes out of the Cancer Institute at NIH in Washington. The word is apoptosis, A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, -P -P apoptosis. And it refers to what they call programmed cell death. It turns out that normal cells have a gene for dying, and the process of dying when that gene turns on is a different process of dying when a cell is damaged and dies through necrosis, such as radiation or some chemical or something. So they know it's a different process of death. Why does that gene exist? In other words, cells have a program for dying, for committing suicide. It is assumed that that program for self-sacrifice is when it is to the value of the larger organism for those cells to die and take whatever pathology is in them with them. What the Cancer Institute in Washington is absolutely dying to do is figure out how to turn on that program in cancer cells. Cancer cells don't know from apoptosis. I can tell you whether they're missing the gene or simply that gene doesn't turn on. But again, the notion of feeling a responsibility to the larger system isn't there. Feeling isn't the right word. Having a responsibility. Sensing being connected in that way. Well, the, the intriguing thing is that chronically troublemaking members of institutions, of the colonies of colonies of cells that we call families and institutions, one finds that the chronically obstreperous person functions like a virus or a malignant cell. And if you carry that further out into the family of nations, the chronically troubling countries, the totalitarian nations, also function that way. They are not self-limiting. There is no sense of responsibility to the larger system. Now, so far what I've done is to show you four different types of life, and what I've said is they are all pathogenic and they all share in common the inability or unwillingness to self-regulate. Two larger things follow from that. Organisms that lack self-regulation will always be invasive by nature. A critically important idea. Organisms that lack self-regulation will always be invasive by nature. 
They are not invasive because they want to be. They are invasive because they lack the program to self-regulate. The second characteristic of organisms that lack self-regulation is they can't learn from their experience. Now, as I say, I think the putting of all of this together is fairly original. I think I'm able to do it because of my twin interest in institutions and cellular processes. But look what that does to the whole concept of immunology, empathy, and everything else. What good is empathy if you're dealing with an organism that lacks self-regulation? You can say you have a larger empathy for it as a piece of life, but the assumption that reasonableness and or love is going to turn an unself-regulating organism into a regulating one is, uh, you know, is pie in the sky. All right, thus far I've talked about pathogenic organisms and their nature. Now comes the other side, and you'll see how it's related to leadership. Even though what I have said up to this point, I think, is 100% accurate, and it must be 100% accurate because it's the way life works in this universe. In spite of that, pathogens cannot create pathology by themselves there must always be the complicity of the host. So now we see that there's a self-regulation issue on the other side, which is pathogens only are destructive when the host also lacks self-regulation. Um, Churchill when asked how World War II got going, said, because the malice of the wicked was reinforced by the weakness of the virtuous. The malice of the wicked was reinforced by the weakness of the virtuous. That is what goes on in institution after institution. That is what goes on in relationship system after relationship system, where those who could be in a position to take a stand and define a position, don't do it. The immediate story that occurs to me, for example, is a, uh, a minister who'd been with his congregation for 20 years, and all of a sudden, one pathogen in the congregation decides to infect his host and begins to talk negatively about him everywhere, join committees to limit his authority, even joins the budget committee to get his salary reduced, and is just one incredible constant bother. When the minister goes to the vestry and says, it is very difficult for me to do my job, they all say, don't worry about him, he's harmless, he's been functioning this way for years, let it be. And no one wants to bell the cat. That is the weakness of the virtuous or the absence of an immunological response. Therefore, where I'm headed this morning is this. I can't prove what I'm going to say. It fits the theory. There are undoubtedly exceptions but I don't know whether the exceptions are because we just don't know enough yet, or simply there are exceptions. People who are well differentiated, or to the extent they are well differentiated in the way I am describing it today and have been, generally have healthier lives, physically. There is some connection, and they do well with disease there is some connection. Always there are exceptions. I think that that must be because in some way or other, 
health and integrity. Now, I'm not using the word integrity in the sense of morality, though that's a byproduct of it. But that somehow health and integratedness of the being are connected. And that somehow or other, the integratedness of the being works against the opportunistic infections that are within an organism. But I want to suggest to you that the exact same thing is true about institutions. That institutions that are well integrated give less power to the pathogenic elements in them. And when an opportunistic infection gets going, it doesn't tend to go as far. There is just no substitute for that kind of leadership at the top. That's why last night I was trying to put together the concepts of immunology and the new understanding of the connection between the brain and the body. They come together as a very solid basis for leadership on two levels. One is well-defined leadership in an institution is more likely to promote the health processes and more likely to nullify the pathogenic processes. Now, let me put in what's obviously an aside. When you first go into an institution, as well defined as you are, if that institution has not yet become integrated, it's going to get real reactive to your efforts to become well defined, and we know that. And that's a large part of the battle. That's a large part of the battle. Yet still, I am fascinated by the extent to which institutions that are functioning well, that have solid programs where people are, have a range of opportunity to feel fulfilled, where, where they feel that the leader is connected. And that doesn't mean you have to make house calls every day of your life. Being connected probably has more to do with spending another 10 minutes just hanging around after services or after a committee meeting and allowing people to come to you. When that occurs, for some reason, the pathogenic elements are less likely to form, and when they do form, they are less likely to continue. Having said all that, And I will go on in a little while and talk about the problems of sabotage. I have also learned in recent years that there's a certain percentage of the human race in leadership positions that have no capacity to hear what I just told you or to function in this way. And my awareness of this came about after Generation to Generation was first published. And I started getting phone calls from around the country from people with, who had problems. They had problems in their congregations. And they'd call me. And I'd be willing to listen in those days to anybody because I thought I could learn more about my own theory and hear. I was just, I wanted more experience. Eventually, I stopped paying any attention at all to what the nature of their problem was or where it was located. And instead, I gave the same advice to everybody, which was, you have to get up before your congregation and give an I have a dream speech. You got to get up before your congregation and tell them what you believe and where you stand. And what I found was, by and large, the people who could do that pulled the initiative out from the pathogenic elements in the congregation. It was an intriguing thing to watch. But what I also saw was that there were some people who, in spite of my advice, couldn't do it. There would be people, clergy, who would call me up and say, I'm desperate to stay where I am. I've got a group against me. 
My daughter's in her last year in high school. My wife has finally found a job she wants. I don't know where I'll find a congregation of the same size and salary. I am really in crisis and trouble. And I would make this suggestion to them. And then what I'd find is they would leave the congregation rather than work at their own self-differentiation. That was a major awareness for me. During that period, two things came together. I was on a plane going, I think, from Dallas to New York. And I'm sitting next to a man who owns his own liquor distribution service in the New York City area. Wine, hard liquor, and so on. And we got friendly, we're having a conversation. And during the process, we realized the plane hasn't taken off. It's 20 minutes past takeoff time. And as near as anybody could tell, the plane was filled. So I went over to the stewardess and I said, what's the problem? And she says, the smoke detector in one of the bathrooms isn't working. And I said, rip it out. And she says, oh, sir, you can't do that. Notice the phrasing, you can't do that. And whenever I hear people like that say things like that, I want to say to them, you mean you have no discretion? You know, just the law of the land. And I get back and I sit down next to this man and we start commiserating about this. I remember saying to the stewardess, do you realize how many people hours you're wasting here? And we get to talking about his business and he has four children, the oldest of which is a daughter. And I said, could you bring a woman in to head this kind of industry? And he says to me, I didn't think so, but I now have decided I probably can. And he tells the following story. His daughter was working for an advertising firm that had to get a contract out down to Texas by a certain deadline time. And it was a $50 million contract, something like that. The people in the advertising firm put her in charge and said, remember, you've got to make that last plane out. Well, somebody snafus in some way, and they missed the plane. On her own, she calls the airport, finds out what it costs to hire a private jet, and sends the thing down on a jet. The next day, when her superiors come in and find out that she had on her own had the nerve to hire this by herself and send it down, they were furious at her. And she responded, you told me I had a responsibility to get that contract assured, and I did what I thought was right. And the man turned to me and said, that's when I decided to bring her into my business. <laughs> now, to repeat what I said, these two stories separate the women from the girls. And it's, I think I know it when I see it, but I don't know how to describe it. That is, when someone comes in to see me for help, and they fall in that category of people who've been filleted of their backbone, I know it. But I'm not sure that I could set up the criteria for you in advance. You see, what's intriguing is this whole way of thinking came out of family therapy in the following way, at least from a Bowenian perspective. As I have written in generation to generation, if you take any garden variety nuclear family, one or more parents, one or more children, then symptoms can surface in one of three locations. They can surface in the marital relationship as distance, conflict, or divorce. They can surface in the health of one of the partners, mental or physical health. And they can surface in the functioning or acting out of one of the children. Those are the same three symptom locations for all families on this planet. Our society is organized around numbers one, two, and three, rather than being organized around systems. So that the average clinic, the average counseling center, will have people who are experts in one, two, or three. 
What Bowen was suggesting is all this focus on one, two, and three, which produces enormous amounts of data, unlimiting amounts of data, is not the way to go. That the way to go is to promote differentiation in the system. That the promoting of differentiation in the system is a broad spectrum antibiotic. It will get to whatever the disease is in there. Where I have carried that Bowenian notion further is to say the way you promote differentiation is by getting a hold of the leader. And that leader must work on his or her own self-differentiation as a human. That leader must work on the differentiation within the system that he or she is leading or serving or supporting or therapizing or whatever. And what is also important is to connect the family up with its past and the previous generations, the idea being all symptoms in a nuclear family are the result of unresolved issues between the parents and their family of origin. It always goes back to some kind of transmission, and the same thing is true in chronically troubled institutions. So you see, the training program that we designed in Washington, and if some of you are not clergy, as I said last night, you could take that same letter, and there's a brown slip in there for, for the other program, and we can tell you the dates and describe it. Well, that is why in training leaders, we try to help them work not only on understanding how systemic processes work, but on their own differentiation. Because only the healer or leader, whatever you want to call him, healer or leader, to the extent the healer or leader has worked on his or her own differentiation, can they then, are they capable of being the kind of presence that will promote the strengths to come out. What I have learned I do, and I can't, I can't spell out exactly how I do it, but I one day realized I am doing it. The way I conduct counseling, therapy, work consult consultation process in any way there's something to it that the least well-differentiated members of the system just drop out. They quit coming. And I get left with the residue of the potential leaders. It must have something to do with the questions I ask. It must have something to do with the obvious that I am not working just for togetherness, but for a differentiated togetherness. And it must have something to do with the fact that I'm going to be challenging more than comforting, and I'm always going to work on the side of responsibility. And by doing that, I'm really testing the system without trying to, and by doing that, those with the potential for leadership are going to love to come back, and those without it are going to quit, in part, out of the hope of sabotaging the whole thing. But I'd rather have them quit than have them sabotage by being present. In all events, to sum it up and then throw it open for questions, and then we'll take a break. I have been trying to continue with the biological models I presented yesterday. I put them in also with some parallels to what I think is spiritual functioning or being. I've tried to connect it to immunology. And I've tried to say that the pathogenic forces on this planet and probably on every other planet that's ever found in this universe will all have the same thing in common. And that the focus on different kinds of institutions, the focus on all the sociological differences of different kinds of families, obscures what is the same. Yet focus on what is the same puts the leader into a much more powerful position. All right, let me stop there and just throw it open for any kind of comments or questions. Would you, could you go to the microphone?
Yes, Dr. Friedman, you, uh, in talking about the chronically troublesome person, said that... The which kind of person? The chronically troublesome yes. person. That the organis uh, organi uh, organism that lacks self-regulation will always be invasive and that they can't learn from their experience. Is this the same as then there is no hope? No. I think what I'm trying to do is help leaders get out of the folly of letting the dependent people in systems run the show, set the agendas, and so on. I think the alternative, in other words, I think I said last night or the night day before, I see our entire society caught up in the folly of trying to put insight into unmotivated people. And that the critical issue in getting change is not making people aware, it's making them want to. And the way I would make people want to is to set limits to their invasiveness and make their dependency as unrewarding as possible. But that is the process of self-differentiation toward that other person. So that the idea would be, if you're in the position of the leader, or you're in the position of, you think yourself as the healthy one, or you're in the position, let's just say, of having to deal with an invasive organism, you begin by defining limits to how much invasiveness you will accept. That puts the other one in the quandary of, do they want to stay the way they are, or do they want to have a relationship with you? It is not autocratic to take a strong stand as long as you give the other one choices. I said that the other day, I'll say it again. Giving the other one the choice of changing in order to have a relationship with you, or allowing them to be the same, but saying, I will not destroy my life in the connection with you is very powerful medicine. But it is very, very hard to get other people to hear that. So, as some of you have heard me say, I will go into church after church in which that session, that vestry, that leadership will not stand up to the pathogen and they'll rationalize it, you know, they'll come and say, we have this terrible minister, we have this terrible member of the congregation, we have this terrible DRE, whatever it is, we want to work things out. And they ask me what I think they should do after they tell me all the terrible things that are going on. I can see immediately this person is not motivated to change, and I will say something like, why don't you just get rid of them? And they will always say, that's not the Christian way to handle things. And my problem is I'll deal with synagogues that have the same problem and they function the same way because it ain't the Christian way to handle them. <laughs> I, you know, I think from age to age, different values of the same tradition are heard louder or not. Uh, I saw one person start to do it, and I don't know what happened to it, of someone going through the entire New Testament and taking all the statements of Jesus and seeing how many of them are challenging and how many of them are comforting. And my guess is the challenging will outweigh the comforting. But why is it that the comforting side is heard louder? You see? Is that true in every age? What's going on, you see, with that sort of thing? In all events, the hope issue is, I think, always there. I think the freedom to change is always there. But what I am trying to emphasize is the self-definition and differentiation of the healthy one rather than starting with empathy and adapting to the unhealthy one. And clearly, unhealthy here means someone who is not self-regulative. How do, you, how do you identify or define the family of origin in an organization? That's more difficult. I, I would agree with that. Um, and I, here and there, I have seen people do genograms of organizations. 
The problem, one of the problems is what is a generation? A generation isn't necessarily 10 to 20 years. It may be, you can almost define it the way you want. It's from leader to leader, you know, or from the time it was at this geographic, loca geographic location. There's all kinds of ways of doing that. The, the family of origin, I guess, I guess what you're saying is there is no extended family to go out to. Is that what you're after? Well, if, if as compared to the multi-generational history. If you're defining it as like the, the parents or the generations would be management person to management person, then where do you put the rest of the staff people who relate to them? Yes. I, don't, I can't give you a quick answer to that. Um, I know of several, for example, just with religious institutions, I know of several um, consultants to religious institutions who go in there and try to get the leadership to ask the question, how come they've had such bad luck in picking so many poor rabbis in a row? You know, what went wrong? And to try to get people to look at the history and to see what is being transmitted. It can be very difficult to get the leadership to do that. Do you think it's helpful to do that in an organization? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And um, with corporations, it could be done also. Do you see any parallels between viral or pathogenic processes? I'm sorry, somebody called parallels between what? Between viral or pathogenic processes and, uh, say, concepts of evil? And if so, do you see well, it as an anomaly? Yeah, I thought I was touching that already. I thought I was, I was aware that I was implicitly almost saying that. Right. I think, from my point of view, again, with the process theology notions and so on, I would see evil as always going along with a lack of self-regulation. I mean, it just follows. All, if you think of whatever is evil in the world is always invasive. And the answer to invasiveness is self-definition. It is saying, you can't take me over. So I think, yes, they are very parallel processes, if not the same thing. And... Um, I guess, um, how would I put it, um, again, I'm not a systematic theologian. If you believe in a God that is a creator of all, if you believe in a God that is a God of freedom, then out of the total set of all possible sets has to be a subset which is destructive to the other sets that just follows from the logic of it all. And therefore, it's up to the sets that are not invasive and destructive, not to permit that set, which is the invasive and destructive, from, to prevent it from taking it over. And that's the way I think I would tend to think in terms of evil. But I have found it really helpful for myself functioning in the world in my own personal relationships, as well as in teaching others or therapizing or whatever, counseling or whatever term you want to look at, to always put together evil and invasiveness. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, there's a line. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one comment and one question. I <laughs> could not help but think of one of your statements on Sunday night as I was reading this morning's paper about the latest fads and techniques that we... Uh, uh, become involved with. Uh, in this morning's paper was an article on TQM, which is the, uh, the hot button for us here in this area, and that it has been so uh, uh, effective in a number of companies, the increase of production cannot keep up with the uh, slow demand of the market economy, therefore they're now having to lay off some people because their production has increased so much. Um, the question I have, and it affects me in, in my immediate family, a member of which is employed by a local um, uh, organization that provides services to the uh, disabled community, and that this TQM has come in, or this fad, shall we name it, 
And the people at the bottom of the hierarchy know what changes have to be made, but see that management will not make them or put this stuff into effect. What can the people on the lower end of the hierarchy do to get that change coming from on top? Yeah. That question is asked at every presentation I make. All right? And obviously, I am talking, I'm talking to leaders. What happens if you're not at the top? What happens if you're in the middle? What happens if you're at the bottom? I think in some situations, maybe what you have to do is just get out. But in some situations, there are some ways of doing things. So I'm going to take a little time with the answer to that question. Maybe, um, how many of you have questions, another four of you? Maybe what we'll do is take the break before and then start with the other four, because it'll take me a little while to do this one. And we really should take a break. But I'll come back to your questions, if you don't mind. Uh, it's just, I think this is so important to bring out. two different things to describe here that come together and I think it's worth taking the time right with it now because it's just an important issue. When I first started doing supervision of anyone at all and I would bring together therapists, educators, business people, lawyers, physicians, they come in small groups usually of about five people One day, I noticed something that has been 100% true ever since. I mean, I'm fond of saying nothing I say is more than 70% true. This one is 100. If a given person anywhere in a hierarchy is trying to function in a well-defined, imaginative way, a self-differentiated way, and the result of that effort brings about criticism, sabotage from around the system. It might be their underlings, it might be their immediate superiors, it might be their peers. Doesn't matter. Whenever that is true, the person at the top, irrespective of gender, sociological category, or anything else, is weak. All right? Let me say that again because it's going to lead to all kinds of things. What I first noticed was, whenever somebody I was coaching to be well-defined, clear, function imaginatively, stay loose about the anxious processes around them. I mean, constantly therapists are coming into me and they describe the place they work as being crazy. And I'm always saying to them, just stay with your work and keep yourself loose about what's happening around you. And maybe you could treat your institution as your own pet insane asylum. And <laughs> it'll teach you a lot about how insane asylums work. And um, it will be a basis for all other institutions in time. And you know where I learned that from? I learned that after Watergate, when someone I knew who worked for Kissinger told me that when Watergate first broke, Kissinger called his whole staff in and said to them, I don't know what this madness is going to lead to, but I don't want any of you messing with any of them. And he walled off the infection. Now, what I mean by weak is, this person is a peacemonger. If you find... This person is more interested in feelings than ideas, more interested in stability than progress. That person at the top is made anxious by change and difference. That person wants to just keep things stable. And what I learned, the great equation I learned was, 
that when people try to be creative and imaginative, and instead of getting supported or getting excitement from people around them, they got sabotage, then what was always true is that this person, they could be 10 rungs above them on the organization chart. It, that's the beauty of this notion. It's again related to the head being a transmitter of neurotransmitters that float all the way through. That head doesn't have to know what's going on here. They get the message. They have gotten the message. That head's lack of differentiation and anxiety has sent out neurotransmitters that have just locked into the right receptors all over the place. Well, having seen that, that's what led to my whole notion of leadership through self-differentiation. Because I realized if this were true, then the opposite was probably true, which is the better defined this person was, the more this person was the exact opposite of the kind I was seeing in difficult, trouble systems, the more this person was the opposite, then why wouldn't a different kind of neurotransmitter be transmitted? A different message would come. My problem is using the word message. I don't really want to use that because it sounds too cerebral, and I think this thing is much deeper than cerebral, you see. It's it's something that takes pathways that are different from... In other words, what I'm suggesting is the old psychological concepts of role modeling and identification and emulation, I don't go with those. I think role modeling is an illusion. It only works with people who aren't a problem to begin with. <laughs> what I'm after is the systemic presence of that head not the messages in the normal sense that it gives out. Anyway, that was the first realization on my part of the connection between the functioning of an underling, the functioning of somewhere down the chart, who wanted to at least be a leader in their part of the organization, and the overall functioning of the leader at the top. Well, what do you do if that person at the top is that way? I think there are several things you do. Number one, you try, as Kissinger, to wall off your system. You work with your system in as well-defined a way. You keep functioning in a well-differentiated way toward the people you lead. But you keep your mouth shut with your anxious peers. And you don't tell them all the exciting things you do or how happy you are or all the innovation you've got because that will trigger the sabotage. You just do it. And when anxiety gets going in the system, you work hard at not getting all caught up in it. But there's a danger here. If you avoid everybody else as a way of staying out of their anxiety, you'll make them paranoid. So somehow or other, you have to find a way of staying in touch with them, but not getting caught up in the emotional processes. This is the critical issue in working with families, where the mother is usually the hyper-anxious woman, all focused about the child, and the father is being constantly reactive to his wife's anxiety. Quite often, the only way that mother will become less anxious about the child is when father can learn to do two things not be reactive to his wife's anxiety, but remain present in her life. That's what's hard to get a father to do. Yet it works like magic if he can do it. Now, here's an example of how it might have worked. I'm now going to tell you the story of a Catholic diocese in a southern state where the diocese is the diocese for the entire state. All right. This diocese had had a bishop for years who was referred to affectionately by the priests in the diocese as a tiller the hunt. <laughs> Honest to God. <laughs> and they were real upset with him he seemed to function in a totally illogical, random manner, authoritarian, 
but capricious. You can handle authoritarianism if it's not capricious, but this capricious authoritarianism is, you know, just impossible. He finally got old and was sent off to a rest home, and they brought in a new bishop who was really kind of to be temporary. And he was brought in already close to 70, about 68. He had been an assistant bishop in another diocese and at the time was heading a large Catholic parochial school. And they really brought him in as an interim. He was, as you might have expected, the exact opposite of his predecessor, a peacemonger, a person who only was concerned that everything went well. He lived in a huge house that belonged to a Revolutionary War hero, and he had put a million and a half dollars into fixing up the house, and he was going to be a bishop in the old style. I think if the minorities in that community had realized he'd put a million and a half dollars into fixing up this house, which had ceilings as big as this in the living room, it would have been something. Anyway, he wanted to live a lifestyle of graciousness, Well, there were enormous problems in the diocese. There were the usual splits of philosophy among different groups of Catholics. There was enormous fighting among the curia of the diocese, which would have been the various priests who had charge of different operations, education, raising money, personnel, whatever you'd have in any cabinet anywhere. Well, who gets the stress? The vicar general, right? The um, person who is the assistant. The person who, in many other kinds of religious denominations, has a similar title, all right? Canon, whatever. And it was the vicar general who called me stressed out of his mind because of all the different conflicts. Two of the men in particular, one with personnel and one with finance, were old curmudgeons, older than the bishop, and they lived in the bishop's house with him. <laughs> Talk about interlocking family systems, right? And the bishop clearly wanted good relationships with them and good relationships with everybody else. And what would happen would be the vicar general, a severe overfunctioner, would rush all over the diocese, putting out the fires, trying to make things work well, or trying to push the bishop to take a stand. And he could never get the bishop to take a stand. Now, we did two things. One was he had me come down to the diocese and meet with all the important people for two days. Now, I was very careful for the, th for the two days doing a presentation like this, never to talk about the problems in the diocese. In other words, I didn't take them off on a retreat to discuss the problems. I did just the opposite. I talked about leadership, and everything I've talked about here in the most abstract way. And the second day, halfway through, it just popped out. All of a sudden, these priests, very much caught along the notions of obedience, finally began to take stands and talk. And the bishop began to realize that he was going to have to take a stand and that the problems were much bigger than he realized. But that which I did was only a part of the process and it was more the catalyzing agent than anything else. Because I was working with the Vicar General on a roughly once a month basis for close to a year first, in which I taught the Vicar General how, to use the phrase that's in generation to generation, how to defect in place. 
how to go over to the other side without going over to the other side. And what I taught the vicar general to do was never to push the leader of the diocese to do something, but always to delegate the anxiety to him. Okay? That you cannot delegate responsibility. It just doesn't work. But you can delegate anxiety. What would be an example? Um, Bishop, um, I wanted to inform you of something. That's a good word, inform. <laughs> There's a group of um, anti-abortion women in the diocese who feel you haven't taken a stand and they intend to picket your house for the next week, 24 hours a day. And this has gotten out to another group of people in the diocese who think this group is absolutely fascist and they're going to come and counter picket. It's probably going to tie up Main Street. It's going to be the lead thing in television all over. I don't know if you want to bother to do anything about it. But I thought I ought to inform you. <laughs> All right. That is the other big way you get poorly differentiated leaders to tar start taking stands. You keep informing them of the problems. Okay, let's take a break till 11.30. Originally, included in my plan to show you another tape of me working with a highly anxious family and how I tried through my presence to get the thing shifted. But as I look at things, where we're at, where people's interest is and so on, I'm going to stay with the leadership one because we really have less than an hour to go. Um, and um, it, it's a tape that involves a couple in their late 50s in which she accuses her husband of sexually molesting their grandchild. And what I tried to show is how staying out of the focus on the symptom, I was able to get the process shifted to the sexual problems in their own marriage and ultimately into her emptiness. And it's, it has, but the focus has more to do with my own functioning in it but um, it is just so much time. Um, what I would like to do is there were three or four people who, had, who were standing in the back with questions. Let's go back to them and uh, I have two or three other items to present. Oh, let me remind you again, if you, I think they're gone from the back. If anybody did not get a letter, one of those letters that explains the training program, there's some up here. Yes. Yes, Dr. Friedman, you, uh, if I can put this together briefly, you suggested that cells last night are encoded for a particular purpose, but that the system will make them be what the system wants it to be. Correct? Well, okay, let's, yeah. In a, a, a rough basis. And yeah, so, go therefore, ahead. in the system, this is happening, but if the leader self differentiates and creates a vision that provides boundaries for that community and a direction for that community, uh, it would also imply then that a lot of the energy that's focused on that system to make these cells or persons conform can then be released into allowing them to self-differentiate themselves into what they ought to be within the system. Does this make some sort of sense? Well, keep going, yeah. All right, and so my question actually comes to, because I can see the energy and the power released in doing that in a local church where people do what they ought to be doing, instead of what the system tells them to do. Uh, and there's a lot of dynamics that, that imply this is true. But what happens with the immunology system? When well, what kind of system? The, the, the immunology of that yeah. system, when the pathogen is now allowed implicitly to do what they want to do as well. And do we need to do anything about that, specifically with that pathogen, in a different sense well, than the rest of the system? Of course, you know, you're raising the obviously basic question of, um, of freedom, and that is how do you balance freedom with responsibility? How do you um, 
create in any society at all an atmosphere in which differentiation is promoted but as soon as you allow for that freedom you allow negative things to happen that's the problem of theodicy that's the problem we all know exists everywhere that's why I keep focusing on this issue in other words how do you know there's a couple of different ways of putting it was Hitler well differentiated he had vision he had goals and so on no because he made his salvation dependent on the functioning of others secondly he was invasive into the life of others and that that's why I keep focusing on functioning rather than beliefs as the key to madness and that's why I it's too easy for the craziest people in the world the maddest people in the world to have good values and this whole, let me try to talk in bigger terms. I'm trying to get away from this focus on the cortex. Every, through everything I've been doing, I've been saying this whole notion, for example, of identification, all the psychological notions that assume that the interactions between people are cortex to cortex, rather than the fact that the important interactions are the way people respond to one another, what they permit in the functioning of one another. And that the leader who is well-defined and does not permit invasiveness or the taking over of his or her space, who also is not invasive of the space of others, is promoting a different kind of atmosphere in which the values are heard differently. Now, if you're going to have a free or promote freedom, then you're going to give at least initial permission to the pathogenic forces to be pathogenic. So that I've thought that one chapter in this book I'm working on might be titled, Vision is Not Enough. It's critically important, but it ain't enough. And there are a lot of people, and there's a lot of consultants out there that just get up and talk vision, vision, vision. Whereas a critical issue after the vision is how that leader functions in the face of the sabotage and everything else. And I don't think you can stop with the vision. But my criterion for who to stop has to do with that notion of people invading, being invasive of others, or trying to take over their lives. So in essence, because they break the covenant, they play by different rules. You could say that. You could say that. Dr. Friedman, assuming that we all live in a pathological society uh, for a long time, and that from time to time leaders come up who are self-differentiating like Jesus or Martin Luther, who are willing to change the system, Martin Luther King, even Clinton now with his healthcare system, what is happening with us when we realize that there are leaders there who are willing to change the system that is sick and try to make it better? I don't know if the world was ever any different. I really don't. And it may well be that great leaders only arise in great crises because the crisis pulls everybody together. I mean, would a Roosevelt or a Churchill have arisen at a different time? Do you need to have the kind of situation where crisis unifies before a leader can really be effective? I don't know the answer to that. It is, you know, is Bowen right that we are li living in a more anxious society? What I distributed yesterday to everybody, those diagrams, was an effort to suggest that yes, there may be at this point in the history of the human species a whole bunch of factors that are increasing the anxiety of life on Earth. And those were all those arrows the, the awareness, for example, of the limitation of the resources on this planet, the overcrowding, the speed of communication, the overloading with information, and all of those factors which have reached new thresholds, I think could be increasing the anxiety. But I'm a little hesitant to say what's happened to us as though we're really different. 
I mean, if life had changed that much, Shakespeare wouldn't make any sense to us. Nor the New Testament or Old Testament or anything else. So there got to have been, there's something that's never changed. What I do not know is, well, I should I put this? Uh, for example, is the terror that is promoted by political correctness on campuses different than the terror that came during the McCarthy period? Is it different from the terror that Stalin consciously used to create a monolithic society there? I don't really know. On the other hand, when, when that kind of monolithic orientation gets going, then the effects are the same. I don't know. Is it really true? I think it's true, but I can't prove it, that the society generally is more adaptive toward the weaker elements in it than the stronger, and that leaders have a hard time either evolving or expressing themselves because of the reactivity against differentiation. It does not seem to me that it has always been that way to the same extent, but I am not sure. That's all I can say. I've got a, a small piece of uh, data um, and to share with the group. What I think is a small question, what I think is a larger question. The data is the fact that uh, I heard on the radio this morning that today is the 487th anniversary of the publication of that German cartographer's map naming this continent America. <laughs> um, the small question is, I was wondering if it is uh, appropriate to think of the virus as the microscopic reptile. And the larger question um, is, uh, suppose the, the leader of an organization is indeed uh, possessing uh, pathogenic characteristics that is invasive and uh, lacking self-regulation. Go on. Well, what, what do those of us who don't have scales and, and think they have hair do to survive in such an organization? Well, I thought I was talking about that before the break. I think you wall off your own system and try not to let the rest of that system screw you up. And you work at keeping a relationship with a leader like that so the leader won't sabotage you. But... Um, Sometimes I think this whole perspective I'm giving you is helpful in knowing when to quit. See, I would take a different viewpoint between families and institutions. In a family, I almost never urge anybody to quit. I'm always on the side that if they will just keep working at their differentiation, they can modify the system. And I don't know whether those who are more successful had more capacity for differentiation or their system was more modifiable. I don't know that. In a work system, I don't know why one has to stay to cure it. I think it's important, you know, to get on with your own life. Though with clergy, when clergy come in to me wondering about whether or not to quit a congregation, I'm always saying to them, when you're ready to quit is when you have the most power. Because now you can do all those things you were afraid to do for fear they'd kick you out. The problem is by the time most people have reached that point, they don't want to even bother to do those things anymore. Um, I think, realistically, there are situations in which if you want to be a creative, imaginative, well-differentiated person, you ought to recognize that the institution you're in or the academic department you're studying or teaching in or the congregation or the hierarchy or whatever is just not the place where you can grow and function. I think that happens. 
I liked your statement that pathogens are only self-destructive by the complicity of the host. And I was the compliant host for many years. And when I had given up on my relationship with my husband and said, well, this is the way it is. I have to be myself. You can choose what you want to do. The whole relationship changed. I was the only one that was willing to change for a long, long time. And when I did, the whole system changed. Yes, I had a woman tell me that just the other day. I was asking her how did she account for the extraordinary changes that have occurred with her family and her invasive pathogenic husband. Absolutely. And she said, um, I quit caring. I didn't quit caring, <laughs> but I quit <laughs> needing okay. the relationship. What I meant was she quit caring how it turned out and just right. started moving Absolutely. in her own direction. Just worked at our own thing. Right. right. I just wanted to hear more about sabotage, unless you think there's something yes, better. I have a whole page here ready to go with that. <laughs> yes. I, I, I was wondering, um, talking about leaving an organization, and I was wondering, any organization would present a person with challenges to have to overcome. So it, is there a better place are, are there places that are, just because a place has a lot of stress in it, does that make it any better or worse, or a, a place that has a more well-defined leadership, would that be better? I mean, who's to I, I guess I'm wondering, is there, is there any, is, are there, I, you, I think you got the question. Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. So much of this is in the eye of the beholder, you know? So much of this is in the perceptions of people. Um, Well-defined leaders will be perceived to be pathogenic by those who just want things to be stable. I think it's, I don't have a simple answer to your question. Well. On the issue of sabotage, which I'd like to go to next. My use of the phrase sabotage as my use of the phrase non-anxious presence comes from Murray Bowen originally. I didn't coin the term non-anxious presence and uh, I didn't coin the use of the word sabotage for the phenomenon I'm about to describe. And I'm going to start with a family. And some of you, I think, may have seen this model before. But it's a way of trying to describe this larger phenomenon that I'm talking about. The bottom line is this. Everything that I have said may sound good to you but you can't get away with it, okay? And that part of the problem of differentiation is, it's one thing if you move into a system, new, and you take a well-defined stand in advance, and you make it very clear to them what your positions are, and they're well-defined to you, and you make a contract around that, that's one thing, though even there, you'll never cover it. But mostly, the problems that occur, occur where the leader starts to move in a better differentiated direction, which is vital to the health of the system, and the system operates in a, really a self-sabotaging way. It operates in a way that isn't good for itself. Most people prefer peace to progress. Most people prefer bread to freedom. The satisfying of instinctive demands is a rudimentary thing that goes back to the jungle. And Freud himself and many others said, 
If you're going to have civilization, you've got to do something with your instincts. You can't have civilization and just function instinctually. But what happens in the process of differentiation is a lot of instinctual stuff gets going. And this stuff is not subject to change because you're reasonable with people. Now, my favorite example of it, because I have seen it so often, taking it to a family first, is the woman who comes in overloaded. And let me just throw in something here. I see women as the quarterbacks in families, by which I mean they really have the most power, but the blame is also more likely to be laid at their feet. I mean, somebody may have failed to block right, somebody may have failed to run the wrong pattern, and therefore the pass is incomplete, but the person who gets blamed and the statistic goes with the quarterback. So I see women as constantly in this position. Most of my practice, like most of everybody else's practice, is made up of women. And so everything that I've been presenting to you today, I find it works equally well with men and women, but I have the experience more with the woman who I find to be quite often the more motivated person to see change occur. And that woman will come in stressed because of her overfunctioning, because she has gotten herself caught in all these triangles. She will complain about various things her husband does. When I hear that, I rarely suggest that she bring her husband in. Because I know that that husband, no matter what he is doing, whether it's passivity, I mean, physical abuse is one thing, but let's say it's verbal abuse and stuff like that. He ain't going to change just because someone tells him it's good for him to change. The pathogen is only going to change when the host says, you can't have a relationship with me unless you modify yourself. So I will work with the woman to define herself in such a way that he can no longer be invasive of her, take her over, where whatever he has been doing doesn't work. If she were to come in, for example, and say, as an opener, my husband is always putting me down, instead of trying to get him to stop putting her down, which will only last for three to six months, I will instead say to her, why does your husband have so much power to determine your view of you? And with that, I will try to challenge her into the notion that her husband's put-downs only have effect because they touch vulnerabilities in her, and that if she can change those vulnerabilities, it's going to stop. What would be an example of that? A woman married to an attorney husband who keeps putting her down with, by writing huge prosecution briefs of everything she does wrong, and she's always on the defensive. And I get her one day to go home, and the next time he does it, she says to him, instead of defending herself or arguing back, Honey, um, do you think we could skip the judgment this time and go right to the punishment? <laughs> that one statement stopped all his legal training. Or I had a great one involving an Episcopal diocese recently with a woman who was the controller for the diocese and she was Latin from South America, very slender, not on appearances the person you'd expect to have so responsible a job. And she said to me, um, you know, it really upsets me if people ask me what I do around here and I say I'm the controller, they look at me and say, you the controller? And she was wondering what to do with that. And I said, well, the next time people say that you're the controller, what she should say to them is, well, actually, I only do that in the evenings. During the day, I clean the bathrooms. <laughs> now, she loved it. Um, 
Oh, another one more example. It would be in, in a law firm. A woman becomes the first female partner, and what happens is she starts making all kinds of suggestions for change, and the next thing she knows, other male partners are coming up to her and saying, you know, you really got pretty pushy in there. And she says to me, they never say that about a man who made those suggestions. And she's ready to make it into a gender issue. And I say, if you make it into a gender issue, you'll polarize the system terribly. What should she do? Well, one would be, the next time someone comes up to you and says, you know, you're getting pretty pushy around here, the response is, well, if you're bothered when I'm pushy, what are you going to do when I genuinely get to being aggressive? <laughs> but understand, this is not just a technique. This is not just paradox. This is an immunological response. This is a response of the self of the person saying to the other, you ain't going to take me over. You ain't going to co-opt my thinking, my feeling, etc. Anyway, I just put that in to show that I'm very much on the side of women, but not by trying to restrict men, because I don't think it works. What I would do with this woman who comes in, she's stressed out, she's complaining, and she's probably in all these triangles, and she complains about her husband who has no help with the dishes or the children, either comes home late or puts on his earphones or watches television, has a daughter who, uh, whose only way of communicating with her is by giving her the finger. <laughs> she has a son who probably takes drugs and maybe is into selling drugs, and a mother who calls her every day she doesn't call her mother. And she says, I have worked for 20 years to keep everything together. I'm fed up, I'm tired. Um, I've had recently some um, lumps develop. Luckily they weren't malignant, but I think it's related, or my blood pressure is up, or I'm having dizzy spells, or whatever. And she'll say, I really would like to get out of this, but I don't really believe in divorce, and I worry that maybe I just haven't done enough or haven't done things the right way. A minister could be saying the same thing in relation to the congregation. And I will say to her at that point, instead of you quitting then, could you function in such a way that your husband quits you? In other words, instead of you winding up with the responsibility for breaking up the marriage, suppose you moved in a self-differentiated direction, and if your husband can't take it and quit you, then you'll know you could never have had yourself and the marriage at the same time. And one of the things I like to do is erase the little center part of all of these people and say to this woman or minister of a congregation, this is the outline of yourself. One woman said to me once, they look like lesions. <laughs> and then I'll say, what I would like to help you do is move out here and complete yourself. I'd like you to focus on you. It's incredible how many people will come back two weeks later and said, I spent the two weeks trying to focus on me and there was nothing there. Their entire life had always been thinking in relationship to others. You know, what's a starting point? Do you have a secret ambition? Do you have a course you'd like to take? Is there some kind of work? Is there some kind of shop you'd like to open? If you wanted to just go ahead and move in some differentiated direction and let things fall, how would you go about it? And so I will discuss with her a way of moving towards her own differentiation. And then I will say to her, and I learned this the hard way, but moving there and being able to stay there are two separate things. Because as soon as you move out in that direction toward the differentiation of yourself, you will leave all of these incomplete organisms here who have 
sometimes I say, you know, you created your own Frankenstein. If you hadn't been so adaptive to everybody throughout these years, you wouldn't be stuck in the thorn bush. Now, if you move out there, every one of them will feel the loss of you. Do not confuse criticism and intense hostility with lack of attachment. Quite the opposite. Quite the opposite. And the more intense these people have been about you, the more intense they'll get. And what each one of them will do is whatever works best to glob you back into the togetherness that had been there. And usually, if I discuss it with the woman, she can tell me what each one will do. My daughter, she'll suddenly disappear for a week. My son, he'll get caught with um, a cache of marijuana in the car. Uh, my husband, he'll get dead drunk. My mother, she'll fall down the stairs and I'll have to take care of her. In other words, every one of them will have some kind of symptom, and the symptom they're likely to have is whatever has worked in the past. So the critical issue is you, ma'am, working on your own self not to be vulnerable to their invitation for stuck togetherness. Sometimes she can playfully do it in advance. I haven't had enough time to deal with the whole issue of playfulness and its usefulness and its role in relationships and in leadership. So she could go to her husband and say, honey, I want you to know there's a sale on your favorite scotch across town. <laughs> Why are you telling me that? Well, remember, I once told you about a job I wanted to take and you told me if I ever took that job, you'd leave me? Well, I took it. <laughs> Mother, here are the names of the three hospitals closest to you. Um, why are you telling me that, dear? Well. I know how important it is for you that I always think about you. And I've decided to go in a new direction in life in which I will be doing less thinking about you than I've ever done before in my life. And I fully expect you to get sick as a result of it. And I thought if you had the phone numbers of the local hospitals, you'd be able to take care of it. Now, sometimes you can do some of that stuff in advance. But sometimes it has much more to do with being prepared for the sabotage. I had a minister come in to me recently. I was seeing him, say, roughly every two or three weeks. And he said, I want you to know I've never seen anything like it. I have never had such a difficult fortnight in my life. I've had people come up to me at the water cooler in the office and just look at me and say, you're no fun to be with anymore. I had three different parishioners call me and make appointments to criticize my sermons. None of this has ever happened before. And I said to him, you must be functioning better than ever. <laughs> the sabotage that leaders experience is, I believe, related to the feeling of loss in the rest of the system when the differentiating person pulls out. I think most sabotage is mindless, it's automatic, it's reactive, and its major purpose is to get the other one to think about you. Criticism is a form of pursuit. And many of the most critical people, their main function is to keep you engaged with them. In a marriage, I have an almost foolproof way to stop criticism, man or woman. Man says to his wife, honey, you have been critical of an enormous amount of things I do throughout our marriage. And every time you do it, I ignore you, I run from you, I criticize you back. But I've got to thinking about things, and I like me the way I am, in fact, I intend to get worse <laughs> in all those ways that you are unhappy. 
but I don't want to stand in the way of your unhappiness. So if you think you could find a man who could satisfy you more than I, I will not stand in your way and I will understand. One man told me that he did that in the middle of his wife's tirade and she just stopped and said, why are you saying things like that? It's taking all the sting out of my remarks. <laughs> Now, the sabotage is equally likely in a work system or a family system. What I think happens is the differentiating person who is in the mode of differentiating simply stops thinking about everybody else as much. They get less reactive. They get less anxious. And what I'm going to say now is a horrible comment on our species, but I think the major way members of our species decide whether or not others care for us is whether or not we can make them anxious. And as soon as anybody in your life becomes less anxious about you, our th your thoughts will go, he don't care, she don't care. I find this an extremely successful, helpful thing to teach mothers of children. I believe that an enormous amount of symptoms first surface in children, not because the parent has become more pathogenic, but because the mother in particular is trying to differentiate herself, even unawaresly, without even realizing it, she's doing less thinking about her kid. One of the first things I look for when families come in about a new symptom in a child is what has been happening in mother's life in the last year or two to get the mother to do less thinking about that child. It's almost always there. And then what I will teach the mother to do is to get more playful with the child around the symptom and not get hooked back in and not get thrown off course. Because what sabotage does, by its very nature, is throw the leader off course. But that's equally true in congregations, where ministers, for any of a variety of reasons, become better differentiated. Maybe they lose a parent and put a lot of effort and feeling into their family of origin like they've never done before. Or maybe they get freed up by the loss of the parent. Or maybe they get some honor or some invitation to become more involved in some major community project. And again, unawaresly, they're putting less think time into individuals in the congregation, if not the congregation. They're not doing a worse job, they're just less reactive. But for the more dependent members of the system, the diminishing of reactivity is perceived as less love. Or maybe the minister does just the worst thing possible and comes to my training program and actually goes out of their way to start trying to differentiate. And then it really hits the fan. Here would be, first, what I think sabotage is about. Or maybe rather, Yeah. What sabotage is about is getting you to think about the saboteur. It's a mindless thing. Nobody on this planet has ever admitted what I was trying to do was sabotage you. I mean, we're watching, we've been watching this thing since Clinton has become president and watching the sabotage led by Dole. I must tell you, I inadvertently, having forgotten totally where I was in Salina, Kansas, two weeks later ago, got up and said that, and then suddenly realized where I was, and I got st a standing ovation. I could not believe it. And what I was saying was that I perceived Dole not to be someone who was creatively, imaginatively coming up with alternatives, but whose primary purpose seemed to be to sabotage. 
I think that's a multi-generational tradition that goes back to 1787. <laughs> that the opposition party, for some reason, always gets into that mode. In all events, I think sabotage is mindless, and when you're in the mode of trying to differentiate, don't expect help from others. Because it's like leading with your chin. What are the forms of sabotage? Outstanding and most common is criticism, intense criticism. And you know it's sabotage because it keeps coming at you no matter how reasonably you try to deal with it. Another form of sabotage is simply dysfunction. Other people will somehow get into the kind of straits, S-T-R-A-I-T-S, into the kind of straits that force you to get involved in them and rescue them. Or they might just get sick. Another form of sabotage is a kind of paranoia. Over and over again, if I am working with one marriage partner to differentiate, the other marriage partner will begin to suspect an affair. Not with me, just that their spouse is having an affair. How could their spouse get so much less reactive to them unless they're involved somewhere else? So a kind of paranoia often develops. You start differentiating in your congregation and members of that congregation will think you're planning to leave. <coughs> And it is the members of the congregation who have been most tied into you over the years who will get most reactive at that point. Saboteurs will create triangles. The mother starts differentiating. The kid works hard to hook the mother in. Mother doesn't get hooked in. The kid will do something in the school system or the court system to hook mother in and create a triangle with an outside institution. Another dimension of sabotage is the other people become more reactive. They don't just disagree with you on things, they go haywire over something you did. There's an inappropriate amount of emotional process in it. Still another form of sabotage is just outright sabotage where they screw you up. You know, they just forget to do exactly what you asked them to do. Another form of sabotage is to make you feel guilty. And they always know exactly what button to push. So they'll get you to feel guilty. They'll do things to make you anxious. They'll become more argumentative and involve you in arguments of little consequence. These are the various forms of sabotage. I'm sure there are others. The important thing for leaders is this. Number one, to recognize that sabotage is a natural part of the leadership process. That beyond vision, perspicacity, beyond motivation, beyond commitment, beyond all the other things that go into leadership is the preparedness for sabotage. And to understand that it's far more likely to be an ambush than something that comes straight at you. And the difficult thing is to somehow have a mantra, a sign in your bedroom, something somewhere because you can't help but get hooked into these things. What you can do is be more prepared for them and when you get hooked into them, pull yourself back out. That's related to the self-regulation. 
One way of be dealing with sabotage is to keep in mind the process and not get hooked into the content of what everybody is saying all the time. In a family system, I would encourage people to forget the content completely. In a work system, you've got to pay a little attention to the content. I remember my first effort at it. I started to try to make some changes in the religious school, and the religious school director went haywire, saying this was her hegemony and I had no right to get involved. She got furious, upset, uptight, and uptighted the education committee who came to me to try to work things out. And I said to myself, there's no way I'm going to compromise on this. I'm the rabbi, and I have the right to do these things. So when the education committee came to me to try to compromise me, I said to them, well, if she's upset by what I'm doing now, I can't imagine how upset she's going to be when I start doing other things in the future. That committee got so anxious they almost couldn't function. <laughs> and I later realized, well, I could get away with that in a family. In a work system, I'd have to add something about the content and what I was trying to do. With most sabotage, it's simply a matter of outlasting it people get tired and it's a matter of touching it just enough so that these people don't feel ignored but not touching it so much that you lose your way in the course you're headed that's the difficult balance to work out you gotta touch it in a work system or it'll keep getting worse but if you touch it too much you'll get thrown off course so it's somehow working out that balance You can outlast them, though, because they'll run through their repertoire and get tired. Another thing that I think is important around sabotage is trying to avoid cutoffs. What happens in sabotage if you get reactive is the system will get polarized and then you'll get a cutoff. I haven't had any time at all to talk about the pernicious effects of cutoffs in work systems and family systems and so on. I once heard Bowen say something like, all pathology in family could be traced to a cutoff back several generations. That may be extreme. On the other hand, working through cutoffs is a really significant issue, both in congregations. It's an important issue around the recent con increasing concern about incest families and uh, the importance of trying to help incest victims go back and deal with the people who had um, done them in and not allow a cutoff to occur. The cutoff itself can be more pathogenic than the traumatic event. I'm sorry, what? A cutoff? Well, in a work system, it would be the people quit the congregation or stop coming to services or refuse to deal with you in any way whatsoever. I, I, maybe the full phrase is an emotional cutoff. That's a better phrase, an emotional cutoff. And it's real hard to avoid those things because those people are going to get at you exactly where it's right. Now, generally, for example, when I'm speaking, I work hard at not being reactive to what are sometimes sabotaging comments. That, this, I must say that uh, these few days have been almost totally absent of what I would call a sabotaging comment. I've rarely seen a group that seems to be as hungry and as uh, really genuinely interested in almost all the questions, I think, you know, have been solid questions. But I can go into a system and do a presentation like this and get sidewinded. And all of a sudden, someone has asked me something, and it happens to be an area I'm really intense, where I intensely believe myself. And the next thing I know, <coughs> I've forgotten what my presentation is, and there I am, you know, dealing with this person and trying to put them in their place. I work hard at not doing that. It ain't easy. But that's what every leader is up against. Now, one more, maybe, major idea. 
and it's related to differentiation and cutoffs and so on. I created a list of what I call the tensions of leadership. And it came out of, um, in the training programs, at one point, we show a movie, which some of you may have seen, called The Missiles of October, which was done way back in the 70s, and showed Kennedy and Khrushchev over the Cuban Missile Crisis. And the movie captures almost every major issue of leadership. And it's personified in, correctly in the way they have Kennedy functioning. By that, I don't mean that Kennedy really operated that way, though I think he did. But they've got it solid. They've got it the way a president should function. And these tensions of leadership came out of observing that movie and the issues where a president has a cabinet that's divided, plus has to deal with the triangle with the military, plus has to deal not only with his opposition Khrushchev, but the triangles that Khrushchev has. All right? And then how does he maintain his, how does he get advice and stay close to others, but maintain his own vision? You know, all that stuff. It's a beautiful movie, if you can ever get a hold of it, for seeing the problems of leadership. It's called The Missiles of October. There's another one which I show called A Very British Coup, which showed up two years ago on public television, and you can get this one. The Missiles of October is out of print. The Very British Coup, I think you can get. It's about a left-wing labor leader who takes over the British government and unilaterally radically tries to change things and then the sabotage. But the difference between the two movies is one is about how does a leader handle crisis that is not of his own making and a very British coup is how does a leader not be afraid for crisis to occur in the effort to bring change. But in each case it's a matter of how do you deal with those crises and preserve your direction. Anyway, the tensions of leadership I think are these. And these are the Koheleth, the um, um, the Ecclesiastes things, that there's a time for this and a time for that. The first is, there's a time where your major concern should be to remain connected, and there's a time where your major concern should be to work at your own differentiation. Two, there's a time to pursue the knowledge of facts and there's a time not to worry so much about the facts and the content and to stay focused on the process. A time to pursue facts and a time to pursue process. Three, triangles. There's a time to work primarily at staying out of triangles or at least being de-triangled, de but frankly there's a time to purposefully create triangles such as that vicar general getting out of the triangle between the bishop and the stress in the diocese and getting out of that triangle by putting the bishop and the stress together. <coughs> Next, there's a time to inform everybody openly and work primarily for openness and there's a time just to keep one's own counsel. I don't have you understand, I don't have answers to this. What I'm trying to s suggest is it's one's resiliency to move between the extremes and to recognize that there are times in life where either extreme is appropriate. There are times to be doggedly persistent towards one's own goal, but there's time to be primarily sensitive to others. In other words, there's a time to be insensitive or the sensitivities of others will turn them into tar babies and you'll never be able to let go of them. There's a time to work primarily at avoiding polarization, but sometimes there's a time to just stiff arm. There's a time to just go ahead and brush the tackler aside. There's a time to be a non-anxious support and there's a time to be a challenger.
There's a time to be decisive, and there's a time to outfumble and purposefully not get stuck with the responsibility. There's a time to do things yourself, and there's a time to avoid taking responsibility. There's a time to act sure and display lots of confidence, and there's a time to admit limitations. There's a time to be playful, and there's a time to stay serious. There's a time to work primarily at being self-protective, and there's a time to be vulnerable. One uh, minister told me that she'd been working real hard to try to bring a ch congregation to change, and nothing she did worked. And at one point, in front of the entire congregation, she just broke down in tears, and she said, from that time on, everything has gone beautifully. And I, in fact, in fact, remembering that, when another woman minister came to me with a similar situation, and she was a super functioning gal who never admitted limitations, she was about to go off on a retreat and she called me from 3,000 miles away, primarily concerned for support to be differentiated, and I said, I think what you should do is break down in sobbing, Hysterics. I didn't use the word hysterics, sobbing, uh, whatever, you heaves, or something like that. She, didn't, she couldn't quite bring herself to do that. But she did go in the direction of telling everybody how stressed and limited she was, and it worked far better in this case than to have continued with the differentiation. Lastly, there is a time to just go on your own authority and this is a time to rely primarily on tradition. Now, as a summing up comment on everything, these are not methods, these are not techniques, this is not data. There's no right answer to any of these. All one can say is, to the extent you commit your life to working at your own self-differentiation, you're more likely to make the right decision along all of these continuums. And with that, the lesson is ended.